Okay, hello everybody and welcome to another video. This is the second log that I'm going to be doing about the challenge I've been playing through as I've been going with my ranger. I was originally thinking, hey, maybe I should do uh, one of these every 20 levels or so, but there's no way we're going to need that many logs. I may do one more when I complete the challenge or at least have hit 80 and finished the personal story and I'll tell you guys how I failed the challenge. Uh, but yeah, so welcome back. I guess now we're level 59. Um, we've spent a lot more hours playing the game here now. There's quite a few AFK hours here, I would assume. But the character is 57 hours old. I almost said years there. 57 hours old. I'd say, you know, maybe five or six of those are AFK hours. But in general, we're still sort of on the ballpark of about an hour for each level. Funnily enough, um, ArenaNet's original statements of how long each level should cost was supposed to be about an hour and a half per level the entire way through the game. When they talked about how this game was going to have a flat leveling curve, that was the sweet spot they were aiming for. And it's funny because these feel like very slow levels compared to the normal Guild Wars 2 experience. And even these are still much quicker than the original dev vision for what they thought Guild Wars 2 was going to be. That's always been kind of an interesting thing to me. But, um... Yeah, an awful lot has happened. Got a fair few things to talk about. As you guys may recall, I gave myself 10 lives. If you don't know what the hell's going on here, I've got a link down below. But basically, as I've been playing this ranger, I've been testing the waters to see what I can do to make the game more fun. Basically, experience the leveling uh, as I haven't since I played my original tune way back uh, at launch. Anyway, so uh, I gave myself 10 lives. Uh, I fully intend after this character to go back and do some more. Maybe stream some of them as true permadeath characters, just one death. Uh, now, I mentioned in the last log that I found it was a little bit too easy, 10 deaths was too many, and one death would actually be really fun, very tense, very nerve-wracking, okay? I've now died 6 out of 10 times, I give myself 10 lives, I've died 6 of them, we're only level 59, we have only just started, as far as the personal story is concerned, the uh, third arc, okay? So it starts with my story, I just finished this at the end of the last log. Um, then we have the Orders of Tyria, which is the whole arc I've now completed. We've just begun the final arc, which is the Elder Dragon Zaitan. So, Forging the Pact is the beginning. That's the bit of Concordia, by the way, which has got all the stupid personal story stuff going on, where now it's attacked by vines, and yet we're supposed to be in the past, and so forth. I've got a lot to talk about with that. Um, and now, obviously, here I am on Shaking the Chains. Level 59 or as it's supposed to be, level 64. Now, yes, I've died six times, but I've certainly learned here, uh, as I've been playing through this character now, Guild Wars 2 is a very, very easy game. All right, I'll talk you guys through where I got those deaths. Death number one, which had happened on my original log, was a death to an Obsidian Destroyer, which are located in Metrica Province. In Metrica Province, there's an event chain where you explore an old Asurigate hub, you travel through an Asurigate, it's filled with lava in there, you complete an event, and the event NPC says, Hey, you gotta leave, get out of there. I foolishly stayed and tried to fight the Obsidian Destroyers that spawn there, and they're designed to basically not die and one-shot you even if you're level 80. So this is why I got my first death. All the other deaths have happened since then, have been kind of interesting. Um, so the second death I had was while I was in Lornar's Pass, I was just outside the Derwin Priory, and using the infamous ranger sword main hand also attack, I killed an enemy and went flying off a cliff. People in my guild had been warning me as well, right up until that moment that it could happen. And I need to be very careful. And I foolishly didn't listen. I went way over the edge, fell a massive cliff, and ended up dying. Kind of stupid, also kind of funny in some ways, but it was a death completely unrelated to the combat of the game. Uh, the second death was very similar. I was going to a very specific place you guys might remember from Lornar's Pass called the Windy Cave. Um, and in the Windy Cave, you can unlock a trait. In this cave, you're supposed to go through some very jumping puzzle-ish stuff. There's wind blows very heavily, can knock you off. I popped Rampages 1, my elite, to give myself stability to push past. Anyway, you descend into this cave really quite deep, do some jumping puzzle stuff, and you grab your trait. The thing is, there's no easy way out. A lot of the time in Guild Wars 2, ArenaNet give you like a button you can press, like a mysterious stone or something, and it will tell you, teleport you back to the entrance. This cave didn't have that, and because I can't waypoint on this challenge, this was an issue. I had to get back. Now, for the most part, I could get back, but there was one particularly big jump that really they hadn't considered people would need to do if they wanted to walk out. There was a weird set of uh, rocks on a cliff that maybe I could have made it, but just things got very hectic. There were some dangerous veteran mobs in the area. Uh, there was the wind blowing. I panicked. I tried to follow someone, and I ended up falling. So that was my second death. Again, not actually combat related. It was more of a jumping puzzle style thing. And again, the game was still pretty easy. 
Nonetheless, despite this, I was now, you know, a few deaths in, starting to get a little bit worried. Uh, the next death came when I was out hunting for pets in Queensdale, in some of the Crichton areas. Turns out the Shadow Behemoth had just spawned. And foolishly, I, I was over-leveled for the area at the time. I was like uh, level 30-something. Uh, but foolishly, I thought, hey, yeah, I can tag this thing. I'll get myself an extra rare. During this challenge, because of the soft reset, that guaranteed rare is actually a really enticing idea. And not just to salvage it for Ecto, but any rare you find, that's level appropriate can really boost your, some of your damage and I'll explain why I was so keen on that in just a second but I thought yeah sure I'll go for it walked remotely near the area I got swarmed by veteran at K they knocked me down continuously I had no sunbreakers on my bar and that was my fourth death following the fourth death um, I started doing something in personal story steps. I started testing some things out. Now, the challenge had been a lot of fun. Uh, some really memorable experiences for me. The idea of getting stuck in that windy cave uh, while I was exploring Caledon Forest, the northern sections of Caledon Forest. I got seriously lost. The first time I've ever been really, really lost in this game. I ended up walking in a big circle. I had some people playing with me at the time and they were just sort of watching and laughing as I flailed around in those swamps up there. Areas of the game I really didn't know very well. I thought I was going north constantly but instead I'd be going east or west, completely disoriented and kept going in circles in this swamp. Um, but you may remember also in Caledon Forest, in that general area, is a Hylic outpost where you can throw a rock um, and enter a cave. There's a bit of a puzzle in there and also some dangerous enemies. Now, I got stuck in this cave. Uh, we went inside. I saw that there was a champion there and decided, you know what, maybe we don't have to fight this champion. Maybe we should do something else. That didn't matter. The door closed behind me, and because I couldn't waypoint, it meant I had to complete this dungeon or die, and that was my only way of getting out. And so this forced me, actually, to take on a champion to do some of the puzzles in there. And not only was my reward there, uh, getting a chest at the end, but it was my actual freedom to get out in Caledon Forest, and that was uh, quite a fun moment. Uh, a lot of my enthusiasm and fun from this challenge has also undoubtedly been coming from the fact I'm playing a ranger, a class I don't really know too much about. But one thing was nagging on me a lot, and that is how easy Guild Wars 2 is. See, here's what you fall into the cycle of, right? You don't want to die. So, what you end up doing is the open world content. Open world content is either trivial to complete, like hearts are trivial to complete. There's no risk with hearts. You don't even usually have to participate in combat. You can just feed cows or whatever, and then you'll get the heart. Uh, or they're events that you can complete with other people. So most of the open world content in Guild Wars 2 is trivial and if it's not trivial, if there is any risk of you dying, 99% of the situations you can avoid it. You can just walk away from it. Sometimes you'll get a weird situation like in the Hylic Cave, but Guild Wars 2 in, generally, in general in the open world is very easy and there is no risk. This takes a lot of the fun away from playing a permadeath character because then what you happen to find is you can spend loads of time in the nice carefree, easy places like the open world then uh, completely over level your personal story or or even go into your personal story when the game recommends you do, uh, head in there and then you can just face roll your way through that too because you've completely out leveled the enemies and yes you're downscaled slightly but there's no difficulty there. And when I got to something like level 30, maybe a little bit uh, shortly after that, definitely, this really started to irritate me. What's the point in playing a permadeath character if there's no risk in the game whatsoever? Um, and so I kind of struck on an idea. For, for a while, I was thinking about, hey, maybe I should have to complete the dungeons as they come up. You know, dungeons would be really hard, especially if you do it at level 30, like when the game wants you to. Those can be really challenging. But there's a problem with that in that I like the idea of this as being a soloable thing, and you bring other players in, and what, they all have to be level 30 as well, or they're going to be level 80s and their full ascended stuff and just face roll the dungeon because dungeons are actually really easy once you get to end game. No, that just didn't seem to work. As great as a solution the dungeon seemed, you know, you'd have this challenge where everything's generally easy but you get to a point where every now and then at various intervals you have to do the dungeons and you're terrified when you go in them and it brings that spike of terror for a little while and then you get to ease off and level up. That was a fun idea but I didn't see it working. Then I realised you could do something like this with the personal story. See, while Guild Wars 2 is really easy, right now, okay, I'm level 59 and my personal story step is for someone level 64. If I was level 64, it would be really, really easy. There'd be no risk there at all. If I was level 70, it would be even easier. However, I found that if you play Guild Wars 2 personal story steps a little bit under-leveled, apparently, according to ArenaNet, they can actually become really, really engaging. Uh, about five levels, a lot of what I've been doing now, um, since I came to this conclusion, 
was I was trying to find a point where you could be slightly under leveled for your personal story and what felt the most fun. You know, what if instead of being level 64, I was level 63? Well, then it gets a tiny bit harder, but really there's no difference. What about 62? What about 61? I found the sweet spot is generally anywhere between four and six levels below the personal story. So I've been playing with a new rule and those last deaths, those last two deaths that I've had have been since I enforced this new rule and it's really turned the game around. Basically, I'm telling myself that I have to be five levels under what the personal story is asking. What this means is that enemies are tankier because we start hitting a lot more glancing blows and obviously we are weaker as a character and they hit us a lot harder. You find generically while playing the personal story, enemies barely do any damage to you and you can just face roll them down very quickly. But when you're five levels under, because you're doing less damage, you're suddenly incentivized a whole lot more to make sure you have the best gear you possibly can have. And this makes it a lot more fun. Okay, one of the core ideas of this challenge was to encourage you to take advantage of things like uh, major sigils and major runes and make sure that every five levels or so you're, you're constantly looking for your best gear. I talked about this in the previous log that I was holding on to higher level weapons and never more have I wanted them now. Now that I know each personal story step I go into, I could potentially die. I really want to make sure I've got my gear up to spec. Enemies are just tanky enough that it always feels really worthwhile, you know, putting say this gilded peridot jewel into my strong ring here. I want to do that because I need that extra bit of power and I need that extra bit of ferocity so that I could kill enemies in a fair amount of time. They're just tanky enough to make me want to get better gear and have more fun with a trading post while I'm playing through this character but not so tanky that it's a complete drag and complete grind to kill every single enemy. And similarly this isn't a sweet spot for the damage you take. If you're foolish and run into a huge zerg of risen as you tend to find as the personal story pushes further up you will die. If a uh, an undead grub spits a bunch of AoEs on the floor and you just randomly walk into them, they will do a significant chunk of damage to you. In fact, it's to the point where enemies feel distinct. Guild Wars 2 enemies, when everything's really easy, you sort of don't care what the reason is that you're fighting. You just care that it's in your way and you want to kill it. But for me, while I've been playing under this restriction, I, for example, know that the Risen Hylek are really deadly. Their blowgun thing does a ton of damage. They're like machine guns. I know that the, uh, like the bloated creepers and the Risen that explode on you can one-shot me. And so every time I'm fighting a group of Risen mobs, I'm not just thinking to myself, alright, use as much AoE as possible and just target what Ever's closest to me. I'm getting more of um, a traditional MMO feeling or even like a Guild Wars 1-y feeling where I look at the group of enemies I'm about to fight and I assess, okay, who do I need to kill first? Well, look, I need to keep my distance from that thing that can explode and could just kill me straight away. I need to keep my distance from these Risen Hylek or be ready to reflect some of their stuff. I need to watch out for the crate that are going to be putting a lot of CC on me because the, uh, the pressure coming in on you is that bit more intense and it's made the game way more fun. In fact, it's made me incredibly incredibly disappointed that the devs have made the default baseline for the personal story so easy. I think people would have so much more fun if they viewed these little personal story instances you're going into as actual mini challenges, which under the, this rule, this five levels under rule, they really are. The personal story has been turned into something fun for me. Instead of all the focus being on the plot and just, you know, grinding through a couple of enemies each time, it really feels like good gameplay. Gameplay that's encouraging me to play smart and gameplay that's encouraging me to build stuff up on my tune too. That said, I have found one other thing that um, still makes the game very easy to use out and that's ranged weapons. Here you can see I've got my longbow. It's a, it's a pretty good longbow. I've tried to make sure it's quite uh, you know up to spec. You'll notice on my weapons here, the uh, great tools are a little underleveled at this point now. But uh, you'll see, I've got major sigils of bloodlust on, a major sigil of battle on here, a major sigil of strength on here. You know, I'm really filling up the slots, making use of as much as many of the RPG and progression mechanics as I can, just because I need that damage in the lower level areas. But you will find range stuff is still really easy. Uh, the AI is so bad in Guild Wars 2, many enemies have so few gap closers that um, unless you're against like a big group of enemies, it could still be easy, too easy to cheese the game out. Like, uh, you could be stupidly underleveled, but because I can just run around with my longbow against, say, this mower, right? This mower could be level 70 that I'm shooting right now, yeah? I, 11 levels higher than me. But because I can just constantly keep it away from me, keep it crippled, keep, you know, just keep kiting in, in small directions, he's barely ever going to get any attacks on me. And if any at all, depending on how smart I'm playing. And so because of this, you tend to find 
Um, or I tend to find originally that uh, even with this rule, five levels under, the game was still too easy. Just because there are inherent flaws in the kind of abilities that enemies have and the way that the AI uses them. And that's uh, what, something that anyone who speed clears a lot of dungeons will tell you is the problem with many dungeons too, among other things. So uh, to address this... I added one other final rule to really amp up that difficulty and encourage me to run some more interesting things in terms of my builds. You'll see here, I'm running Lightning Reflexes. This, to me, never really looked like an exciting Ranger skill. Survival, evade backwards with a crack of lightning, dealing damage and gaining vigor. Okay, so what does this actually mean? Well, the damage is pretty much nothing. It will remove Immob from me, though, and it's just a dodge roll. The uh, final rule that I'm playing with is I have unbound my dodge roll key. And I can't cl click to dodge roll anymore. This is like a crutch in the gameplay that means even if I put myself massively out of position into a huge group of mobs, just the fact that I can go basically invulnerable by double dodging whenever I make a stupid mistake, again, makes stuff like kiting away for ages. You know, this man might finally get a stray hit on me, but I would just dodge roll it. And again, things were too easy. By disabling dodge rolls for myself, it means that blocking skills like Great Sword 4, and it means skills, utility skills like Lightning Reflexes or Protect Me, which otherwise I'd always brush over, are now things that I'm considering in my build. It's also a matter of me now also considering, you'll notice most of my stuff here is just full damage, damage, damage. But, um, you know, it's right on the cusp where I actually think to myself, you know, maybe I should build some defense. I did have a lot of vitality gear for a while. I think this is the last thing left. Um, you know, actually building defense into my character too. I really think that that combination of the five levels under and the uh, no more dodge rolls has heightened my experience of this game so much. And it has meant that I've died twice. Those last two deaths were legitimate deaths. Claw Island. Oh my god, that was crazy. Fighting actual herds and hordes of risen armies on Claw Island. Any one of them could kill me at any time. Combinations of like a uh, crate that would emobe me and then uh, Hylek just gatling gunning me down. Very dangerous. I'm playing on a class that's pretty overpowered when it comes to the down state. And even through that, they managed to kill me. And this is exciting to me. It means that if I was to do this on other characters, you know, you'd have that guy die and then you quickly go back in. You'd reroll, you'd try a different class combo and maybe then eventually complete the challenge. It's actually made this more of a challenge rather than a, oh, here's a fun kooky little thing I'll do till I get to level 80, which is exactly what I wanted. Overall, I would love to see ArenaNet actually implement some kind of hardcore. I've always thought ArenaNet needed more of a re-leveling system in this game. You know how you get 100% map completion and a little star appears next to your name? I've always thought, as lame as you might think, like Call of Duty Prestige and stuff is, I've always thought you should be able to get map completion the once, get that star, and then there should be a re-level system where you can go back down um, and everything's harder. Maybe they stop you being able to level up. Uh, until you complete personal story steps. So I cannot get past level 59. Experience uh, gain on this character is disabled until I complete this step of the personal story. And if you die, the character goes to the graveyard. But if you manage to complete it, if you get to the end of the personal story, then you get a different colored star and you can show that off. I think that would be such a strong feature for Guild Wars 2. It's replayability, potentially limitless replayability for people. It's a fun new way to go back and experience the old content and actually be engaged by it. And it's a healthy way to spread players around around Guild Wars 2. Like, where am I right now? I'm in Timberline Falls, right? This isn't a standard end game area. A feature like that keeps people spread out, makes the game continue to feel populated instead of everyone congregating to the same areas. I think a re-level system, and particularly a hardcore character leveling, would just be so good if they were to officially support it. And if they ever did, I swear, the five levels below personal story thing is, is phenomenal. It's really, really quite fun. You guys should have been seeing some footage of that as we've been playing. All that said, uh, I don't want to linger on the idea of Guild Wars 2 is easy uh, for too long and what I've been doing to address that. But uh, there are still some stupidly flawed things in the personal story that you just notice as you're replaying. Bosses. ArenaNet just couldn't design bosses. The most engaging and difficult parts of this game, especially under this challenge, are actually when there's zergs of enemies, lots of enemies fighting you. It's those that are the, the, the dangerous situations. Every single time, without fail, there has been a boss in the personal story so far. I've actually breathed a sigh of relief, and this is a mistake. The bosses shouldn't be easier to kill and less of a threat than the trash is. Uh, well, the greatest example I can think of is halfway through the personal story where you get to the bit with a pale tree and you see the vision of ore. Um, you have these massive fights with tons of risen out on the fields. Really dangerous, really cha challenging, exciting gameplay. You know, the threat of dying there is really very real. And then uh, the whole thing ends 
with a fight against a boss just outside the gates of Ara, who the story sets up to be, oh, this is your final challenge, the gatekeeper. And you go to fight him and it starts playing all this epic music, like, oh, 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 you know, all this crazy stuff going on that should make you think this is a difficult boss. This boss, I swear to you guys, was the easiest thing in the world. I stood there auto-attacking with my greatsword, and there was pretty much no way he could kill me. The combination of me being there with Traherne helping me, I'll add as well, playing five levels below the personal story is really fun because it uh, it makes all those allies you're playing with feel really impactful. It's not like they're just there getting in your way. Like, you really rely on them. They feel like just as powerful units in the battlefield as you do. And, you know, that opens up more interesting things like when they die, you might want to resurrect them to keep them going, use them as meat shields and so forth. You actually feel like they have some use. But uh, this boss, at the end of the ore vision, was disgustingly easy. He had one attack. Attack. It was a giant hammer blow that took him about six seconds to get the full wind up off and I'll, I'll do this for you guys Okay, six full seconds. Here we go, right? He attacks me one two three four five six. Oh, he's hit me again that is the kind of attack that should be one-shotting me. It should be, oh, he's got this huge tail. Get away from him, get away, because he's rooted with his hammer over his head as he's charging up. And then when it lands, okay, cool, now I didn't get one shot. Now I get to move in and attack again. He, Even if that was the mechanic, he would still be easy to kill, because you could just equip a longbow and just pace around him. Plink, 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 plinking away, and you'd never die. But even that wasn't true. If he managed to land this attack on you, he would do like an eighth of your max health. That was the entire boss fight, standing there auto-attacking with my my greatsword using the occasional skill 2 and skill 5 or even skill 3 it was ridiculous and while this is a particularly potent example of what I'm talking about it's not that uncommon nearly every single boss or in fact without fail I think every single boss has been really easy to kill even the giant dragon that you fight at Claw Island on your return to Claw Island uh, glass the plague bringer whatever his name is was ridiculously easy to kill I just stood there with a longbow again plink 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 away until he died no direct damage came at me whatsoever that's a huge flaw with the personal story that even a challenge like this where I'm trying to make things difficult and engaging throughout and largely I would say I've been successful in doing um, the, de the devs have failed to do. You know, there are some blanket things that they could apply to the game, like, you know, just people are lower scaled as they do personal story, that would make a lot of things more fun. But um, if they wanted to make the bosses better in the personal story... Just so much is wrong with it, they'd have to start from scratch. I do think ArenaNet can design good bosses now. You look at the kind of stuff they did in the Queen's Gauntlet. If we were looking at that kind of tier, that caliber of bosses through the personal story, people would have probably very different experience and um, opinion on the personal story, but it just it, it really has failed to manifest, even remotely. Other minor things uh, that we don't have to talk about too long. Number one, gold. Gold, there are still strong sinks for. Uh, I've got five gold on me right now, but as I'm leveling up, when I go to the trading post, I do think the trading post is a really good thing to do in this challenge, by the way, um, because it adds that gold sink. When I go to the trading post, like these two rings I bought, they were like a gold just for the two rings. So another gold for uh, the earring, sorry. Another gold if I wanted for the ones below. You can quickly run out of that money. And indeed, because of what I talked about with the five levels below, because the game is actually challenging, uh, you would be surprised. Like, I do actually run through this gold, and this has been fun. It's high enough that I've constantly been spending it but it's low enough that I actually want to save more gold as much as possible. I've kept salvaging stuff so that I can sell cloth and things which sell for a lot on the trading post. That's been really cool and just as I said before there are too, there are too few karma sinks. 22,000 karma. You guys know I've been buying uh, lion guard weapons and stuff and like uh, cultural weapons with karma just to try and keep my karma down. There's nothing to spend this stuff on. Karma needs uh, much better sinks. It's just uh, a non-currency frankly and that's a bit of a shame. That would have been a cool mechanic. Alright, moving on from difficulty, I was going to end the video talking about that, I guess it was what was on the top of my mind. Let's talk about personal story in terms of story. I mentioned to you guys on my first video, one of the reasons I wanted to re-level like this was I wanted to really uh, assess and see what I thought of the personal story, you know, like two years after launch basically. Um, it is bad. There's a lot really bad about the personal story. I do happen to think that the first arc here in the story journal... Um, this is the strongest, the My Story stuff. I, I had an awful lot of fun in the game there. It felt a lot more cohesive. The stuff in the Orders of Tyria, um, yes, was fun. Now, I chose the Order of Whispers, which I consider to be the best order in terms of story quality. Uh, they build up your mentor, Tybalt, uh, better than I feel any of the others do. Um, but still, there are some glaring issues. And in fact, I can bullet point it into four great offenses, okay? I think that in general... 
Um, the personal story is weak. The system they use to deliver dialogue is weak. The amount of animations they could display to us, um, the length of the personal story instances, the uh, frequency of the instances used were all big mistakes that just uniformly drag the personal story down. But in terms of where the actual narrative goes and things that the devs neglected that just make it feel so bad and rushed, um, can be these four. Uh, four big offences, right? The first big offence, to me, um, is the fact that your original mentor, uh, Zodja for me, um, whoever they are, they get relegated to just someone who ends up sending you some mails. I will say, one of the most fun- I really feel like the strongest part of the personal story, um, in the entire personal story, even though I haven't played it all, I can't assess it all just yet, but my favourite part definitely so far, and I remember this even the first time I played through the game, of the personal story, is just as you first get to Lion's Arch. Mechanically for me, my first arrival at Lion's Arch was awesome. I was level 29, I finished that first personal story step, where all of Destiny's Edge get back together, that leveled me to 30 and suddenly my world exploded. I got a trait point, I got my elite skill, I got the ability to almost go back and get a bunch more cultural stuff. I could now go around the world unlocking new traits. I was at the hub of the world, Lion's Arch had all these Asura Gates now available to me. I was playing as though I couldn't use any Asura Gates until I'd first walked to LA. And everything exploded open, so mechanically that part of the game was very strong. But in the story too, because we had Zodja, now we learnt this bit more about her. Definitely she needed more exposition in the early areas of the story too. Um, but they have this big breakup. And you're there in Lion's Arch as you load out of that personal story instance thinking about Destiny's Edge and their history and what could be going on with them and how they're going to get back together. And at that same moment, you get a mail about your order. And all of a sudden you realise, oh yeah, there's this whole other facet to the story. I just joined an order. And that's a very exciting moment. It feels like there's a lot going on with that plot. And if there had continued to be more things going on with your original mentor, if instead of the odd mail every now and then, you had two basically different branches of the personal story going on in tandem and you had to complete them both you know Zodja was chiming in a lot and you had stuff going on with her real personal story stuff not just dungeons and you had the order that you were ranking up through at the same time that would have been a lot more fun but they never did that they never had the time for that she just became the shallow background character that sent you an odd mail every now and then and you could basically forget about and every time I got a mail from Zodja it just reminded me of that fact and how sad it was that the personal story had failed in this way the uh, second big offence came a little bit later, and this is one that I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Probably not their heads do. The way they handled the orders and how you do just like a couple of missions, and then you're like, Oh, you're now the highest rank, lol, go enjoy. Terribly done. Uh, again, this is just a sign that things were rushed. We spent so long pre-launch being told about how important the orders were and getting excited about what order we were going to join. You know, it was Guild Wars 2's equivalent of what faction were you going to be. Um, and then it just ended up a handful of tiny personal story quests. Even the Order of Whispers, which I felt was done most convincingly, um, fell short. Now, I thought they had a good idea. At first, yes, you were with your order, but it didn't have anything to do with the dragons. So for the uh, Order of Whispers, you're looking into more Crichton politics stuff with Cordicus's daughter, Demi Beetlestone. And there was some fun story there, but then they just suddenly rush you through things way too quickly. Uh, you have a small branch where you're dealing with other races and you need to choose one. I think uh, the story would have been a lot more strong if you actually had to uh, visit all three of these races throughout your personal story, which would have given you a lot more time with your order. You know, perhaps each time you went to a new race, you learnt more about your mentor, more about the way that your order worked each time. And you could still give players choice at that part, but the choice is which race do you want to visit first rather than which race do you want to visit full stop. If we'd visited all three races, and then we got to a point where it was like, hey, yeah, you're quite a high rank within our order. It wouldn't have felt so jarring and so stupid. It also would have given us more time to uh, be friends with our mentor before they died. I'll talk about the death in just a second. Um, but another thing I think that they obviously really messed up with your order was there was nothing um, mechanically going on with your order outside of personal story. There was no reason to visit your order headquarters. There was no semblance of like side quests. You know, any other game, if you joined a guild like this, you'd have probably a main story going on, but then there'd be optional tasks you could do. There'd be reasons to speak to other members of the orders, learn more about how they work, more about their history. There was none of that. In fact, it took ages before you even reached the Chantry of Secrets as a member of the Order of whispers and when you get there barely anything is explained there at all and you the next time you visit it is when it's suddenly under attack or very dramatically there's no connection there that lack of side quest content that lack of feeling like you really are a member of these people and just whizzing through them being out on the field all the time with your mentor rather than with more members of the order uh, that crippled the plot all right the third big offense 
Uh, and this is, again, a very big one. This is your uh, mentor dying. Now, a big part of this, I think, ties into the second. The fact you are whisked through your order storyline so quickly and suddenly a big member of them. Um, but even then, the way that they handled it was just terrifyingly bad. Even if we ignore the fact that all three mentors all have the exact same death sequence, all of their excuses for killing themselves there... Uh, was very badly done. I appreciate the sentiment of making you like a character a lot and then killing them off, um, but the whole reason was just shoddily implemented. Each mentor should have had their own exclusive way of dying, and it just means you come out of Claw Island with a really sour taste in your mouth. The uh, way that they introduced Traherne, who I maintain is actually a pretty interesting character, and so far I still feel he's an interesting character, but the way they introduce him just after your original character has died, or like a second before your original character has died, is tacky, and it's it's a big reason why people don't like Traherne. Uh, the fourth big thing that I've really taken offense to with the personal story that I just thought was stupid was the fact they set up this attack on Lion's Arch, make it out to be this big thing, uh, and then you just spend ages wandering around doing your own thing for a while before you finally return and liberate it. It removes the urgency from that entire story arc completely, and this undermines the overall narrative for fighting Zaitan. Like, the whole point of the fall of Claw Island and the attack on Lion's Arch is so that you feel like Zaitan is a threat and so that you want to kill him. But it's handled so badly because you don't really see Lion's Arch get attacked properly at all. You hear that it's fallen, but then nobody treats it seriously. You run off just developing some kind of super weapon with someone else, and it's largely forgotten until you choose to return and liberate the people of Lion's Arch and save Claw Island once again. Uh, these things were just terrible parts of the personal story that were all made worse by the, uh, you know, the generic flaws like the way that they developed the dialogue, and uh, it's making me see, just as I did before, how badly it was all done. Um, and I pin most of the blame not on, like, dead laziness and not on um, NCSoft pushing some kind of early release date that they weren't ready for. I push my blame on this to the amount of branches they put in the personal story. This idea of uh, choosing just one race to help instead of all three is a perfect example. If we had helped all three and they had designed the story so that everyone experienced all three and there was actual progression going on through them, can you imagine how much better this whole order arc would have been, how much longer it would have been and more time you would have had to have enjoyed the company of your mentor? But because they decided, oh no, everyone needs to do different decisions, because of that alone, it crippled the personal story. Why was our mentor's death so cheesily and poorly done? Well, because they had to do three mentor's deaths and they ended up not being particularly creative creative or well done on any of them. I really do levy most blame on all of the problems you see here, um, except the technical ones like how small the instance is and so forth, just the amount of options that they give us. So far I'm unsurprised. Um, we are moving in though now uh, to the later stuff. Obviously this is the final arc of the original game, The Elder Dragon Zaitan. Uh, this will have some more interesting lore stuff, I guess, to do with the Lagos, I know in particular, to do with Traherne himself, and some of the dialogue gets a lot more poetic, which I do enjoy, um, and I guess in the third and final log, I'll just talk briefly about that, but, um, but yeah, so far, just replaying through this, it just reconfirms the stuff I thought, don't know whether that's good or bad. A couple of little things I guess I'll mention. I will say I did the Hylix story while I was playing through this. I didn't think the Hylix story was that bad at all. I think of all the race ones, like I, I just, I knew I didn't want to do Quaggan because just they look so stupid in the cutscene. I didn't particularly like the story that much. The Hylix one, it wasn't too bad. So I actually think I've got the best experience I could have. I'm in Asura, so I got all the stuff with Professor Gore. I went to the uh, Order of Whispers, so I got all the stuff with Tybalt. And I got more stuff with Professor Gore because I was a member of the Order of Whispers. And I chose the uh, best race, in my opinion, quality-wise, which was the Hylek 2. Uh, so this is the very best personal story thread I can actually imagine taking. And you can still see it's got massive downfalls there anyway. One big topic that uh, you can't really blame the personal story alone. But that has been very stupid and eye-opening for me. I knew this was a thing in the game, but I'm experiencing it firsthand now. Um, is the fact that Lion's Arch is destroyed. And so you do these missions where, like, Tibalt is selling apples in Lion's Arch. And he's saying, oh, keep it down. The crowd's around. You've got to be quiet. Don't talk about the order. And he's just stood there in a wasteland when no one else is around him at all. Clearly the destroyed ruins of Lion's Arch. It's kind of funny to see that kind of thing for a little while. You know, kids playing in the flaming wreckage of a city and they don't really seem to care about anything that's going on around them. Yeah, it's funny for a while. But, you know, when that humor wears away, you just realize that what they're doing with the living world right now and changing the way Lion's Arch looks, changing the way Concordia looks and so forth, it's just crippling your immersion. 
progression completely in the personal story. And I shudder to think what that experience is like for new players coming into the game. Uh, I, I will say, I think that the experience of playing Guild Wars 2 now as a new player is so much better than it was at launch. Like with mega servers, with wardrobe and everything else they've added, champ boxes, it's so much better. But the personal story, which was already bad, hasn't gotten any better and if anything it's got worse because of the living world things. Like what are people going to think when they first get to Lion's Arch on their first tune? So dumb. So dumb and it was big opening. I did read a comment from the forums uh, where a dev commented on this and they were saying it was just something to do with the, the technology. But I believe they are looking into it. I just hope it's fixed sooner rather than later. Um, for everything negative I've said about the personal story, playing the game with all the sounds on, playing it with combat mods to uh, like turn off my UI in the bottom right here. So many questions on the last log, by the way, about how to do this. Uh, it's from combat mode, okay? Look it up. I've actually got a video. There'll be a link in the description. Um, but playing with this, playing zoomed in with the new FOV, the new camera centering, uh, the ambience in some of these places is phenomenal. The Order of Whispers base is incredible to wander around in. I've seen a lot of vistas, even Timberline Falls itself. To the north, there's all these giant waterfalls. It's a real pleasure. The game is incredibly immersive under these settings and these rules um, and definitely you do get to feel that in a lot of personal story areas too so it's got that going for it but then the whole game's got beautiful maps right we already knew that uh, but there you go guys a bunch of loose thoughts about the challenge as it's been proceeding uh, whether I you know go over 10 deaths or not on this character I'll keep playing it testing out the five levels thing probably have one more log when we get to the very end there is a big bit of discussion that I want to have in a separate video probably has already gone up on my channel again there'll be a link down below uh, to do with the trait system there's a lot of very positive things I've experienced with the traits now uh, that this challenge has opened my eyes to you'll find my impressions about that there but also um, there seems to be a very big gap in Guild Wars 2 at the moment. The trait system has offered a lot of really awesome things, but is also lacking in some big ways. So I did an entire video on that topic alone, which you can check out there. Um, but yeah, so thanks guys. Uh, another long one. Let me know what you think if you've been playing it yourself. And I know loads of you guys wanted to at the very least. Um, what rules you might be playing with yourself or just how you found re-leveling. Uh, it's been interesting to me, obviously. I've been talking so long about it. And uh, I guess I'll see you next time. One more log and then we'll be done. Have a good one, everyone.